No. 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 It's, it's a material thing. <clears throat> Listen again to the definition. The loss of gravity or the lightness of the heart that arises due to attachment or aversion. Attachment and aversion are material. Hmm? The symptoms of chapalyam are, are lack of discrimination, harsh speech, and whimsical behavior, all of which we see in materialistic people. Hmm? I suppose there's some, there's some examples in Srimad Bhagavatam, but I don't have them in front of me right here. Okay, two more, three more. Nidra, nidra means deep sleep or complete unconsciousness. It's defined as the absence of the external function of the mind arising from anxiety, lethargy, natural disposition or exhaustion. It's called nidra. The symptoms of nidra are yawning, inertia, closing the eyes and shallow breathing. That's pretty clear, right? Nidra. Supti. Supti means dreaming. Sleep in which there are many impressions within the subconscious mind and the manifestation of many different pastimes is called supti. The symptoms of supti are cessation of the external function of the senses, breathing in and closing the eyes. So when one is dreaming, he's experiencing so many pastimes. Huh? Like last night, last night I was dreaming about New Taliban. And I went to New Taliban. And uh, it was time for the Sunday feast. And the devotees were all like dressing up like demigods with these big headdresses with big like gold, you know, fancy gold things, and they were all like, you know, talking to each other in this very fancy, fancy way, you know. And, uh, and I was looking, at, I was with some other devotee, and we were walking around looking at them and going, like, why are they doing that, you know? They're like all these really glittery, glitzy costumes and all this stuff. And, you know, we got to the we got to the feast and there was no prashadam left. So, it's typical experience. <laughs> anyway, um, they're all dreaming. And finally, bodha. Bodha means awakening. The enlightenment or awakening of knowledge that occurs upon the cessation of ignorance Fainting or sleep is called bodha. Bodha, yeah. Cessation of ignorance, I love that. The cessation of ignorance. It just has such a nice feeling to it. Mm -hmm. huh? The cessation of ignorance. I just like that term. I'm going to say it again. The <laughs> cessation of ignorance. <laughs> we should all have this experience. Huh? Bodha. The cessation of ignorance. When knowledge reveals that, uh, like the sun, lights up everything in the daytime. Huh? Krishna explains this in Bhagavad Gita. That realization is bodha, awakening. Huh? So awakening can be awakening from sleep or fainting, but it really means awakening from ignorance means self-realization. So coming out of dreams and sleep, you notice the, the order? Nidha, Supta, and then Bodha. Bodha means awakening from sleep. That not any more sleeping, not any more dreaming, not any more ignorance, but knowing really who you are and what you are. Huh? in eternal life. That's awakening. That's real life. 
this other life in this material world on this temporary identity based on the body, this is dreaming, this is sleeping. Huh? I mean, we see this all the time. Like when you walk around in the material world, uh, we were at the store yesterday, and uh, some rascal lady was there, you know, the, the superintendent who gives out the money to the cashiers at the store, you know. And, oh, she was just so ugly. She was so incredibly ugly. And she thought, she was thinking, I am the, sh the, the head of the cashiers, and I get to give out the money to everybody. And this is, this is who I am. She was actually thinking like that. And I have a right to be ugly because these are young, young girls and I'm the, I'm the boss of all of them. And I can be ugly, I can be nasty, I can say whatever I want and treat them however I want and they can't do anything. And I was thinking, wow, you know, this is such amazing ignorance. Here is this lady in her 50s and she doesn't have any beauty at all, not internally or externally. Huh? It's only, only cruelty and, and viciousness and forcefulness and sleep. Huh? And I thought back, I was thinking back on my early life and how so much of my motivation in life came from seeing my own family members huh? getting old and they had no, no beauty about them. They had no... They had not attained anything wonderful in their lives. Everything in their life was just ugly and, and depressing, angry, bitter, you know, nasty. And, I, and so much of my motivation came from seeing that in my early days and thinking, oh, I don't want to wind up like that. Huh? I want to attain something beautiful in this life. So, you know, even if I do get old and sick and, and my body becomes impotent, I can look back and say, ah, at least I did this something beautiful, you know? And so, so actually, at this point in my life, I'm very satisfied, you know? I've, I've written uh, commentary on Vedanta Sutra. I've made so many other books and recordings and videos and preaching about Krishna and kirtans and everything like that. I have no worries. Uh, I've actually attained everything that I set out to attain in this life. And now, now we're in the extra credit, <laughs> the extra credit uh, stage of the course where I'm doing things I never thought would be possible for me. I mean, I thought it was, always thought that it was possible to attain self-realization. I never doubted that. I always thought I'm going to attain it in this lifetime. Huh? But I never thought that I would be able to um, to make a community, or uh, you know, start a whole branch of uh, our sangha, our parampara. That's amazing to me. It's astonishing. I never thought I could do it. But by the blessings of my spiritual master, I'm able to do it. It's not really my potency. It's his potency. I'm just following his orders, so somehow or other he's <laughs> empowering me. But it, I don't think of it as being me or being mine. Or, uh, you know, I don't think like I'm the doer. Mm -hmm. It's just happening. It's happening around me. And uh, these boys, you know, are coming and studying. And uh, well, I guess they're learning a couple of things. But <clears throat> anyway... Uh, this, this th stuff that we're talking about is very advanced. You won't actually run into this. You won't actually experience this stuff for maybe years, you know. So, but I had to say it. I had to discuss it just for the record to show that it's there. And this is really the focus. This is really the center of our teaching. This rasa tattva. Rasa tattva means the truth about transcendental love and relationships. Rasa tattva is the center of the esoteric teaching. It really is the esoteric teaching. And all the other stuff, 
you know, the rituals and the mantras and the prayers and the philosophy and the reasoning and all that stuff, that's all subordinate. That's just, that's just um, preliminary. It's just so you have enough background to understand what these transcendental relationships and transcendental emotions are all about. Why do we feel a certain way towards Krishna? Why does Krishna feel a certain way towards us? See? How do these feelings develop one into another? How do they grow? See? We're just in the beginning of this. We're just talking about the vocabulary. These are the different feelings. Now, how do they relate dynamically to one another? Which of them are harmonic, harmonious with each other, and which are inharmonious? Which, in other words, which are rasa? Rasa means relishable, nectar.